In the past module, we focused on the pharmacodynamics of dopaminergic and noradrenergic medications, uh, and mainly we discussed the treatment of ADHD. Now we're going to focus on the pharmacodynamics of serotonergic medications, and we're going to specifically be discussing the treatments of anxiety and depression. Guidelines are a great resource um, that can help you decide what to start with first for your patient who is newly diagnosed with anxiety or depression. The first line medications include most SSRIs, certain SNRIs such as venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine, as well as bupropion. Second line medications include ones with more side effects, such as tricyclic antidepressants or atypical antipsychotics, or ones that we have less experience with their use, such as reversible or selective MAOIs. Um, also, other second line medications include other SSRIs and SNRIs, such as trazodone by Lazadone and Libomilnocipran. Third-line medications include ones that can have severe life-threatening side effects that require dietary restrictions and closer monitoring. You can look at the CANMET guidelines in order to more specifically see which SSRIs are first-line, look at their mechanisms of action, as well as their common dose ranges. SSRIs are all part of the same class of medications because they all inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. However, they also have their own unique properties. One of the main differences between SSRIs is their reuptake transporter affinity, as can be seen in the diagram below. Citalopram and escitalopram are one of the most selective SSRIs as they have a higher affinity to the serotonin reuptake transporter versus an norepinephrine reuptake transporter. In fact, citalopram is 3,400 times over three orders of magnitude more potent at inhibiting the serotonin reuptake transporter um, than the norepinephrine reuptake transporter. So if you look at the diagram below, you can see that citalopram and sertraline tend to be more serotonergic than paroxetine, fluvoxamine, and fluoxetine that have noradrenergic reuptake activity. And at the very, very right, we can see tricyclic antidepressants that are, of course, have very high affinity for norepinephrine reuptake. Now, as discussed before, citalopram and escitalopram tend to be highly serotonergic. They're also structurally related. However, escitalopram tends to be less sedating. Sertraline is unique because it has weak dopamine reuptake transporter um, affinity. So it can increase dopamine levels, especially in the higher dose range. It tends to be syner synergistic with another dopamine reuptake inhibitor known as bupropion. Uh, the combination of bupropion Wellbutrin, bupropion, plus sertraline, also known as Zoloft, tends to be called Welloft in the literature because it tends to be very effective for patients which have low energy levels. Um, so sertraline can improve symptoms of hypersomnia, low energy, and mood reactivity due to its dopamine reuptake properties. However, higher levels of dopamine, especially in the higher dose range, can also cause overactivation of patients with panic disorder um, and a higher, can cause have a higher risk of anxiety. Sertraline also has alpha-1 receptor actions, which contribute to its anxiolytic and antipsychotic actions uh, in patients with delusional and psychotic depression. Um, there are also other medications on the market that tend to have noradrenergic reuptake activity, uh, for example, fluoxetine, which tends to be activating. Fluoxetine blocks a 5-HT2C receptor and increases dopamine and norepinephrine levels that way, so it's considered energizing and fatigue reducing. However, fluoxetine is not usually good for patients with anxiety, agitation, and insomnia for the same reasons. Paroxetine is interesting. It has noradrenergic reuptake activity. However, it's also sedating and calming in comparison to sertraline and fluoxetine. And it's usually preferred in patients with anxiety. It can be anticholinergic, but it's one of the most anticholinergic SSRIs. And it also has more severe withdrawal due to anticholinergic rebound and its short half-life. Fluvoxamine, uh, similar to sertraline, has alpha-1 receptor actions. However, it's even has a more potent affinity for the alpha-1 receptor than sertraline, and so it has a major advantage for psychotic and delusional depression. You also have other SSRIs that are known as serotonin partial agonist uh, as well as reuptake inhibitors, so that includes vortioxetine and vilazidone that are partial agonists at the 5-HT1A serotonin receptor. Um, through the partial agonist activities, these uh, these drugs can also increase dopamine levels, and for those reasons, they have lower risk of cognitive side effects and sexual dysfunction. You also have your atypical SSRIs that tend to be good for insomnia. For example, trazodone and mirtazapine that are highly sedating can be used at bedtime. Um, these medications, trazodone, mirtazapine, and buspirone, also tend to be augmenting agents that are added to SSRIs. This is especially a good thing to do for patients that tend to be moderate responders to SSRIs or who are highly resistant to SSRIs in general. Now, a really good way to understand um, different antidepressants is to consider the following resources that are all public, uh, 
commonly available for psychiatrists and pharmacists. Uh, they are all published by Stephen Stahl. Uh, one example is Stahl's Essential Psychopharmacology, which goes over the different medications or mechanisms of action, the different their different receptor profiles. Uh, the prescriber's guide tends to be more practical because it has more information about commonly used doses, what to do when the patient experiences certain side effects, as well as how to augment a drug to improve benefit. I want to talk about an important gene called ABCB1, which codes the ABCB1 efflux transporter that exists at the blood-brain barrier. There are patients which have the ABCB1AA variant, so culprit SNPs. These patients have increased activity of the ABCB1 efflux transporter at the blood-brain barrier, and thus in increased efflux of the antidepressants that are substrates of this transporter. And this increased efflux occurs from the brain into the bloodstream. So these patients would have lower concentrations of the drug in the brain and higher concentrations in the bloodstream. They tend to need higher doses for brain entry and efficacy of the drug. But because more of the drug is being kicked out into the bloodstream, this drug can accumulate in the bloodstream. And that increases the risk of side effects, which are due to the activity of the drug in the peripheral organs. These peripheral side effects include sweating, vision problems, tremors and muscle twitching, teeth grinding and jaw clenching, weird shock-like sensations in the arms and legs, dry mouth, dry eyes, gastrointestinal issues, and heart palpitations due to QT prolongation for patients who have other genetic risk factors for this side effect. Now, the effects of ABCB1 are not clinically irrelevant in ultra-rapid metabolizers because these patients are clearing the medication so quickly at the level of the liver anyway um, that the medication doesn't get the chance to reach the right concentration in the bloodstream, let alone to reach the blood-brain barrier. The effects of ABCB1 are noticeable in normal metabolizers, uh, and the effects of ABCB1 can be exacerbated in poor metabolizers because these patients are already clearing the medication so slowly at the level of their liver that the, that the drug accumulates in the bloodstream, and because the drug can't get into the brain as much, it tends to stay in the periphery. So for patients who are poor metabolizers who have the ABCB1 AA variants at the culprit SNPs, you really want to avoid the medication that is the substrate of the ABCB1 transplant. Now, the medications that are ABCB1 substrates are listed here. This includes most medications on the market um, that are used for the treatment of depression and anxiety. The ones that are no non-substrates are too few and far between. Um, that includes egomelatine. That's not even available in Canada. Um, but however, it can be accessed through the special access program. This, this medication tends to be really useful for patients who also have sleep problems. Other uh, options include bupropion, uh, desvenlafaxine, which is not considered a substrate in in vitro studies. You also have fluoxetine, which animal studies state that it's not a substrate for ABCB1. However, human studies state that it may be a minor substrate. Um, so it is, it is better than using other substrates that tend to have a higher affinity for the ABCB1 transporter. Um, other options include mirtazapine and trazotone, which can be sedating, as I mentioned before, and can be used for patients at bedtime. Now here's our algorithm, which includes the two culprit SNPs. Um, as you can see, I'm gonna highlight really the main variants that cause increased risk of uh, efflux uh, of the substrates. That includes mainly uh, the, the AA variants and the two culprit SNPs, which if you add the scores of 0.5 plus 0.5, you would get a total score of one. And according to the algorithm, it, that we have in the back end of our software, if you have a score of one or more, you're considered to have increased clearance of the drug from the brain into the bloodstream. Now, if we look at statistically the risk of the side effects, it's about 12% of the human population. Um, so it's not common, but it occurs enough that it can be a problem for patients. And we tend to see it more often for patients that come to personalized prescribing because those are the ones that tend to struggle more with their medication. Now, we talked about COMT in the setting of dopaminergic and noradrenergic medications, uh, because as mentioned before, patients who are, for example, COMT-GG at the RS4680 SNP in the COMT gene uh, tend to have lower levels of dopamine and norepinephrine and can benefit from dopaminergic medications. Interestingly, however, these patients who have low levels of dopamine and norepinephrine tend to be more resistant to treatment on SSRIs. As can be seen here in the diagram, COMP-GG patients are also known as patients with a Val-Val variant. And as you can see here, um, patients with a Val-Val variant in the diagram uh, tend to have a lower reduction in, their ha in the Hamilton depression scale score um, 
over the course of six weeks on an SSRI compared to patients who, who have the VALMET or MET-MET variant. The MET-MET is also known as COMT-AA, um, and, and the VALMET is also known as COMT-AG. Um, so really, patients who have the GG variant tend to be more resistant to SSRIs and a reduction in their depression symptoms. SSRIs and SNRIs increase serotonin levels, and this has an inhibitory effect in dopaminergic neurons, leading to a dopamine deficiency and problems with motivation and concentration. Um, this tends to be worse in COMP-GG patients who tend to have low dopamine and norepinephrine levels at baseline. Uh, for the COMP-GG patients, you want to consider an alternative medication that doesn't act on uh, the serotonergic pathway, especially if these patients don't have concomitant an an anxiety, you can actually consider uh, dopaminergic medications such as bupropion, meclopamide, selegiline, and if the patient has been diagnosed with ADHD, you can consider a stimulant. Uh, if the patient has concomitant anxiety, then you might want to combine an SSRI uh, or an SNRI with uh, these other dopaminergic medications. There are also a lot of SSRI side effects that I want to go over. Most of them tend to be dose-related, such as stomach upset and nausea, but the patient can gain tolerance to the side effect after being on the medication for two weeks. Uh, stomach upset and nausea are most common with fluvoxamine and paroxetine. QT prolongation is also dose-related and is common with citalopram and e-citalopram. Anxiety and activating effects are more common with SSRIs with norepinephrine reuptake or dopamine reuptake properties. Sedation is common with mirtazapine, trazodone, and paroxetine. Also, all SSRIs can cause a reduction in concentration. Uh, this tends to be a class effect, but it's less likely with sertraline due to its dopamine reuptake properties. Anticholinergic side effects can happen with certain SSRIs and include urinary retention, dry eyes, dry mouth, problems with memory and concentration. This tends to be more common with tricyclic antidepressants relative to SSRIs. However, paroxetine is the SSRI that has the highest risk of anticholinergic side effects. Sexual side effects is also a class effect of SSRIs and tends to be dose related. Uh, you really want to consider alternatives that are not highly serotonergic for patients at high risk of sexual side effects. These medications include the dopaminergic ones such as bupropion, as well as ones that have documented low risk. In very rare instances, um, it's possible for e a patient to persistently have sexual side effects even after discontinuing the SSRI. This has been reported recently in the, in the literature, and this is known as post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. Uh, this is only based on case reports. The mechanism is unknown, and there's no known cure. And again, it's very rare. There are also extrapyramidal, extrapyramidal side effects that can occur on SSRIs, and they're dose-related. These include bruxism or jaw clenching. For patients who do experience a jaw clenching side effect on SSRIs, one of the things you can do is add buspirone, and that will mitigate that side effect. There are side effects that are non-dose-related. Um, these include allergies, insomnia and fluoxetine, weight gain on mirtazapine and paroxetine, as well as suicidal ideation. If a patient experiences suicidal ideation on a drug, the best thing to do is to discontinue the medication and find an alternative. There are a few SSRI counseling points. Um, the first two weeks of starting SSRIs uh, are the worst. It usually gets worse before it gets better. Patients tend to experience increased anxiety and GI side effects, and this can be mitigated by the addition of a benzodiazepine on, a, on an as-needed basis. Uh, for anxiety for a short period of time until the patient is stabilized on the medication. At two weeks, patients start to feel the benefit of the medication and gain tolerance to many of the side effects, especially the gastrointestinal side effects and the anxiety. By four weeks, the patients just start to feel the full benefit of a medication at a particular dose. If the patient tolerates the medication and has some benefit, consider titrating the medication to the therapeutic maintenance dose as per the patient's metabolism status. Now we're going to go over the main side effects of SSRIs one by one. As mentioned prior, um, the main S culprit SSRIs in terms of risk of QT prolongation are citalopram and e-citalopram. This side effect, however, is also common with other classes of medications, such as tricyclic antidepressants, as well as some antipsychotics that are used for depression, such as quetiapine. This is a dose-related side effect. The higher the dose, the higher the risk. P QT prolongation can be life-threatening because it can cause arrhythmias and sudden death. And drug-induced QT prolongation is defied, uh, defined as a QTC interval greater or equal to 500 milliseconds or greater um, uh, or th that involves an increase of 60 milliseconds or greater in the QT interval compared with pre-medication. The symptoms of QT include heart palpitations, fainting, and hypotension. 
QT prolongation risk factors are listed here. This includes old age, baseline bradycardia. I highlighted the main important ones here, such as diuretic treatment. Mainly the risk is due to uh, electrolyte imbalances that can, cost, can be caused by diuretics. Patients that have pre-existing heart disease, such as a uh, history of myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, uh, uh, as well as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction tend to be at higher risk, um, as well as, as I mentioned, a QTC interval greater than 500 millisieverts. Mm receptors. Also, a decrease in caloric expenditure due to the sedative effects of certain medications can occur. Dry mouth and throat may lead to increased ingestion of high caloric beverages as well. Despite the short-term weight loss that can occur during acute treatment with SSRIs, several studies indicate that long-term use for more than six months can actually lead to weight gain. And of the antidepressants, the highest risk is with paroxetine, mirtazapine, and the tricyclic antidepressants. The use of bupropion can promote weight loss, and so you can consider this medication as an add-on. And if weight gain is due to sedation, consider a dose reduction. I also want to talk a little bit about SSRI withdrawal because this commonly happens in practice. This is more common with drugs with a short half-life, such as paroxetine or venlafaxine. Drugs that have anticholinergic effects can cause cholinergic rebound, for example, paroxetine, um, as well as drugs that have no active metabolites. They can be higher risk. If your patient has been using the drug for at least four to six weeks, they are at risk of withdrawal. Obviously, the risk significantly increases the longer your patient has been on the medication. Also, rapid tapering. If you're tapering the drug in, for in less than one to two months, this results in higher risk. Sudden discontinuation also um, is not a good idea. Usually, SSRI withdrawals occur, occurs one to 10 days after you discontinue the medication and re can require two to three weeks or in very rare cases, up to one year to completely resolve. The symptoms can be remembered by the acronym FINISH, and that includes flu-like symptoms, insomnia, nausea, imbalance, sensory disturbances, and hyperarousal, which mainly manifests as agitation or anxiety. One of the ways that can, you can help your patient is by substituting the SSRI or the SNRI with the drug fluoxetine because it has a very long half-life and so its withdrawal is less severe. You can also slow down your taper and resume your SSRI if your patient is really unable to tolerate um, the withdrawal and you can go even more slowly. There are several tapering schedules that you can use. You can taper the drug by 10 to 25% per week or 12.5% every two weeks. You can also try tapering it down by 25% per month over four months. It really depends on your patient's tolerance to the taper. Now let's discuss serotonin syndrome. You've heard of this term before. Uh, this is a potentially life-threatening syndrome that is due to the use of serotonergic drugs and overactivation of both the peripheral and central postsynaptic 1A and 2A receptors. The syndrome consists of a combination of mental status changes, neuromuscular hyperactivity and autonomic, reactivity. Serotonin syndrome can occur even if the patient is using a serotonergic drug as monotherapy. Um, this is more common with poor metabolizers, patient taking, uh, patients who are taking very high doses, or the elderly. In fact, um, there was a case study in the literature where an 85-year-old man experienced serotonin syndrome on a very low dose of paroxetine, just 20 milligrams. So it seems that Older people are more sensitive and they can experience certain serotonin syndrome even if they're taking one medication at a very low dose. Um, in the younger patients, usually you, can, you see serotonin syndrome if there's a drug interaction. Uh, for example, the use of MAOIs and SSRIs is contraindicated due to the very high risk. Also, you want to be careful if you're co-administrating drugs that are serotonin releasers or 5-HT receptor activators. These include amphetamines, opioids, tryptans used for migraines, or ondansetron. Uh, that's used as an anti-emetic. So uh, if your patient is in a combination of an SSRI and, and, or an SNRI and a serotonin releaser, you want to monitor them more closely for serotonin syndrome. Also, over-the-counter drugs such as dextromethorphan, St. John's Wort, and L-tryptophan can cause serotonin syndrome when co-administered with SSRIs and SNRIs. Here's a list of signs and symptoms. The main ones that we tend to see in practice are things like tremor, hyperreflexia, um, rhythmic muscle spasms that can occur in the arms and legs, in the eyes. They can be spontaneous or induced up upon physical examination by the physician. You might also see dilated pupils, sweating, increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, and fever. These are the autonomic symptoms. Also, they can be accompanied by mental status changes, such as agitation, excitement, restlessness, confusion, delirium, and in severe cases, seizures. We have a 46-year-old man who came into a medical clinic complaining of muscle aches and twitching. 
which he first noticed two days before. This patient is currently prescribed sertraline at a very high dose, 200 milligrams per day, buspirone at 15 milligrams twice a day, as well as trazodone at a very high dose, 200 milligrams at bedtime. He also took a blood pressure medication and a torvastatin. This patient walked into the clinic also with an odd stiff leg gait and a noticeable hand tremor. He had high heart rate and high blood pressure. He also had pressured speech and appeared anxious, and he had beads of sweat that were visible on his forehead. So as we can see here, we have the whole triad. We have muscle aches and twitching, so neuromuscular symptoms. We have autonomic changes, and we also have mental status changes. This patient is clearly um, anxious um, and is having uh, issues. And as we can see here, he's taking three ser serotonergic drugs. And so we can more comfortably say that he is at high risk of serotonin syndrome. And perhaps we want to reduce the, the dose of trazodone or buspirone or, or um, discontinue one or two of these medications. Another important side effect that tends to be bothersome for a lot of patients that can result in non-adherence is sexual dysfunction. It's a class effect of SSRIs and SNRIs because these drugs tend to reduce dopamine levels because high levels of serotonin tend to depress dopaminergic pathways. And as we can see here, the highest risk drugs are the highly serotonergic ones, which include citalopram and sertraline. However, there are other ones such as paroxetine, fluoxetine, and SNRIs such as venlafaxine. Now, the risk is much lower with antidepressants, of course, that are dopaminergic and noradrenergic. And a really interesting tidbit here is even though citalopram has a prevalence of sexual dysfunction that is as high as 20%, escitalopram actually has a prevalence of just 3%. So just by switching the patient from citalopram to escitalopram, you can drastically reduce their risk of sexual dysfunction. Now, you're forced in a situation where you have to use an SSRI or, or an SNRI if your patient has anxiety, because the only way to mitigate anxiety is really to, or the main way to mitigate anxiety for most patients is to increase serotonin levels. Uh, and so here's the options that you can use in this situation. This includes desvenlafaxine at doses 50 milligrams or less, fluvoxamine at doses less than 100 milligrams per day, and vortioxetine at doses less than 15 milligrams per day. These are the lowest risk medications. And the reason why desvenlafaxine is preferred uh, over venlafaxine is because, as mentioned in previous slides, it inhibits serotonin and norepinephrine at the starting dose. This is very different from venlafaxine which has a much higher affinity for the serotonin reuptake transporter in comparison to the norepinephrine reuptake transporter. And you don't get really noradrenergic activity until you get to doses higher than 150 milligrams per day. Another thing you can do if the patient can't go off the drug is to half the dose. This tends to improve symptoms in 75% of cases. You can also, <coughs> excuse me, alter <coughs> the timing of the daily dose. You can try switching to a non-serotonergic agent or a par partially serotonergic drug, um, such as the ones listed here. You can also add an antidote, so a dopaminergic drug such as bupropion or amantadine, or you can, you can add on buspirone, or um, another example would be to add on something like Viagra which works in 65% of patients to improve erectile dysfunction. However, unfortunately, this won't deal with, deal with the low sexual desire problem. Um, Yohimbine has also been used, as well as some interesting over-the-counter drugs like pycagnol and ginkgo biloba, um, which at certain doses can have vasodilatory effects that can help the patient. It's more common with anticholinergic medications, such as paroxetine. For patients on paroxetine, you may want to consider a dose reduction if they're experiencing dry eyes because this is a dose-related side effect. Alternatively, if, the, the, if you go lower and the dose is not effective for the patient's symptoms, then you can treat the dry eyes by adding in artificial tears, which can keep the eyes lubricated. You want to be aware that eye contacts can also increase the risk of dry eyes, so it's best to recommend that the patient discontinues their use if possible. Also, if eyes are dry at bedtime, in addition to using artificial tears in the morning, you may choose to recommend an ointment such as Lacrolube at bedtime. And the ointment is best used at night because it can blur vision throughout the day. In general, for most artificial tears, you do not want to use them more than four times a day. This is mainly because most types of artificial tears contain preservatives and overuse can lead to even more discomfort and redness. If artificial tears are needed for more than four times a day, that means it's time to switch to a preservative-free artificial tear, which does not contain uh, 
a preservative called benzylconium chloride, which is a very toxic preservative. And preservative-free eye drops tend to be more expensive, but they're definitely safer to use for your patients. And if eye symptoms persist despite the use of preservative-free drops in the nighttime ointment, it may be time to speak to the physician about prescription eye drops. Be aware of, uh, to, to recommend that patients do not use antihistamine eye drops, which are mainly for patients that have allergies. These drops also contain an ingredient that's that's used to get the red out. Uh, 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 these products include Visine and Clear Eyes, and they should only be used very sparingly and on occasion. You wanna try to avoid the use of these drops if possible. And it's important to note that overuse of, these, of, of the antihistamine eye drops can cause side effects such as rebound redness and superficial punctate keratitis. Uh, they can also dilate the pupils. So really, if they're making things worse rather than better, it's just best to avoid them. And when someone's first presents to your pharmacy with symptoms of dry eyes, uh, especially if they're on SSRIs, first of all, you wanna start with something that has carboxymethyl cellulose or hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, so CMC or HPMC, uh, such as Refresh Optive, Refresh Liquid Gel, Gentile, Moderate to Severe, Lacro, Blink Tears, um, they're all listed there. This is mainly if their symptoms, symptoms are mild, you can also cons consider cysteine and refresh tears. However, uh, if the symptoms are refractory to these artificial tears, then you wanna move on to something that has PEG 400 uh, or polyethylene glycol or propylene glycol because these ingredient, active ingredients tend to be more effective. So now we're moving on to cysteine ultra and soothe as an alternative. Then if symptoms continue to persist, um, you can consider gel or lipid formulations. They tend to be more thick, so they stay on longer. However, they, they, they can be a little bit uncomfortable for those reasons. And then, of course, um, if, if your patient has symptoms at bedtime, that's when you want to add the lacrolube at bedtime. So you can take a look at this article uh, called Artificial Tears Potpourri, a literature review for more details about these ingredients. But this diagram, which I got from the article, is really highlights uh, the main different products that you can use at different stages of dry eye disease. And of course, if the over-the-counter products are not effective, that's when you would move to the prescription eye drops and that would require a physician consultation. Now let's move on to talking about special cases with the use of SSRIs. Pregnancy is one of them. A, a lot of patients will ask you, are SSRIs safe to use in pregnancy? And you really wanna have an honest conversation with your patient to weigh the risks and benefits of treatment. It's important to note that the majority of da databases and case cohort studies have not shown an association between SSRIs and congenital malformation. However, there are a few exceptions. Uh, for example, there have been studies showing the possibility of septal heart defect as a potential class effect of SSRIs. However, the risk is still very low. It's 0.5% for the average population and just 0.9% with the addition of the SSRI into the mix. For paroxetine, there has been a two times increased risk of cardiac malformation in the first trimester. However, as you can see, the absolute risk is still very low. It's 2% uh, with paroxetine versus 1% without. For fluoxetine, it has been very well studied, and there have been many studies showing birth defects, as well as a potential excretion into the breast milk, which is something that you want to consider because patients, they usually want to stay on, on the same drug during pregnancy and, and after they give birth. Um, avoid the use of paroxetine or fluoxetine if they've never been used before due to the higher congenital congenital malformation risk. You can continue this medication, these medications if they've been effective for the patient and there are no other alternatives. Uh, this is mainly because the absolute risk is very low, though the risk is still there. So just be aware. The jury is still out on SNRIs, although venlafaxine can cause preeclampsia. So this requires blood pressure monitoring during pregnancy. You wanna avoid the use of anti-epileptics as much as possible because they have been proven to be teratogenic uh, during pregnancy. There's limited info on, on atypical antipsychotics. These medications generally should not be used for depression during pregnancy. Uh, they should only really be used if the patient has bipolar disorder. Uh, there are limited, uh, there's not enough information really um, to be able to make that call. Of course, if you had a patient with bipolar, you would rather choose an atypical antipsychotic rather than an antiepileptic because antiepileptics have been proven to be teratogenic, whereas with atypical antipsychotics, we just don't really have enough information. In a woman who is a smoker who is trying to quit, 
you should really be considering bupropion since antidepressants are safer than nicotine during pregnancy. Now let's move on to another special scenario, which is depression in old age and those over the age of 65. Generally, older people tend to be more sensitive to medication, so you really wanna start at a much lower dose. You wanna start at a third or half of the usual dose uh, that is recommended as the starting dose by the manufacturer in the drug product monograph. This is mainly due to pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes that occur with age. The elderly tend to be more sensitive to a drug at a given concentration. The half-life of antidepressants generally increase with age due to reduced metabolism, and it takes a longer amount of time to achieve steady state. Body organs also have a decreased capacity to adapt. So side effects related to dose or concentration take longer to resolve. There's also a progressive loss of functional body tissue at the cellular level, and that's the reason for which homeostatic mechanisms that function via central and peripheral feedback tend to be altered in the elderly, and, and that is why they tend to also be more sensitive to the side effects of medications. As I mentioned before, there has been a case study that has shown that a patient who was 85 years old uh, experienced serotonin syndrome with the use of only one serotonergic drug, paroxetine, at a very low dose, 20 milligrams. So definitely be careful in this patient population. Guidelines also show that there are some medications that are safer than others for use in this patient population. The safest ones to use are citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline. They tend to be more serotonergic than drugs of this, cl uh, of this class, the SSRIs. Uh, they tend to have a cleaner receptor profile and be more specific to the serotonin pathway generally. Uh, with sertraline, it does have some dopaminergic activity. As I mentioned, it's a weak DAT inhibitor. Uh, however, that's to its advantage because it tends to have less cognitive side effects than other SSRIs. You wanna avoid the use of antipsychotics in the elderly for the treatment of depression because of the high risk risk of extra pyramidal symptoms, even at very low doses. There's also the risk of stroke, cognitive decline, and death and dementia. You only use antipsychotics in this patient population if they have active psychosis or mania, as per guidelines. You also want to avoid the use of tricyclic antidepressants and paroxetine because these drugs have a very high anticholinergic side effect risk. They can cause uh, dizziness, problems with focus, uh, urinary retention, etc. Tricyclic antidepressants can also cause orthostatic hypotension, which in addition to the anticholinergic side effects can increase fall risk, uh, which is highly related to morbidity and death in this patient population. If a tricyclic antidepressant is absolutely needed for severe insomnia or the treatment of neuropathic pain, you wanna use the lowest dose possible, and preferably uh, you wanna use nortriptyline or disipramine because they tend to have the lowest anticholinergic side effect risk. It's not that they don't have anticholinergic side effects at all, uh, but it, they tend to occur at a lower frequency and with, a, with less intensity uh, compared to other tricyclics. You also want to exercise caution with the use of mirtazapine and trazodone because these are highly sedating medications. You only want to use them if the patient also has insomnia and you want to use the lowest dose to control the symptoms. With SSRIs and SNRIs, there's the risk of GI bleeds, especially if the patient is also on prednisone or NSAIDs. Also, there's a risk of hyponatremia uh, in, in the elderly due to the syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone release. So you want to check sodium levels one month after starting the medication, especially if the patient is on a diuretic. Also, there's a risk of fractures and falls due to um, reduced uh, bone mineral density. This tends to have... I, what a lot of people don't know is in the elderly, SSRIs and SNRIs tend to have the same fall, fall risk as benzodiazepines. Uh, which are on Beer's list of medications to generally avoid in the elderly. Um, so you really want to be careful, monitor the patient's bone mineral density if they have osteoporosis, um, and um, just generally use the lowest dose possible to treat the symptoms. If the patient is on SSN, uh, SNRIs, as I mentioned before, you want to monitor blood pressure. These patients also tend to be more sensitive to serotonin syndrome, so as much as possible, try to use monotherapy as opposed to polypharmacy. Fatigue and daytime sleepiness are also a major problem uh, because these patients tend to be uh, tend to have multiple comorbidities. Uh, for example, they may be also on blood pressure medications or cholesterol medications. Uh, they may be on medications for type two diabetes. Um, and fatigue and and sleepiness tends to be a side effect of all of these medications, in addition to SSRIs and SNRIs. As much as possible, if the patient is taking their blood pressure 
uh, other medications such as those used to treat blood pressure, cholesterol, or type 2 diabetes, recommend that they take these medications at bedtime uh, because then they can sleep through the majority of the side effects. Same thing with, with SSRIs and SNRIs. If they're not activating for the patient or don't increase their energy level too much, um, and if, if especially if they're sedating, you want to take them at bedtime instead. The only exception to this rule is diuretics. Even though diuretics can be fatiguing, you don't want to take them past 4 p.m. because it's going to keep the patient up at night because they need to take tr frequent trips to the washroom. So generally, as much as possible, recommend that patients take their medications at bedtime to sleep through the side effects. I want to talk about another important uh, thing that you usually tend to do with patients is switching their medications from one to another. www.switchrx.com tends to be a great resource for this, uh, where you can put in uh, the medication that the patient is currently using and the one that you want them to switch to. And this website, which is completely free, will give you an algorithm that you can use uh, when titrating down the dose of one med and increasing the dose of the other. Um, this, this website tends to be kept in check by a pharmacist who became a psychiatrist. Um, so she has a lot of information about medications and she's put it all on this website that it's a very useful resource for us as pharmacists. And for example, um, there's different switch methods. One example is direct switch, uh, where you stop one antidepressant and start one right away without any down titration. This, of course, uh, tends, to, tends to increase the risk of withdrawal. However, if the patient has been on the first medication for less than six weeks, uh, the risk of withdrawal tends to be really low. So this can be done. You also want to do a direct switch if the patient experienced a severe adverse drug reaction on one medication, such as, for example, an anaphylactic reaction or, an, or an, a severe allergy, uh, which warrants uh, stopping the medication right away. You can also try tapering down one medication and immediately switching to the other. Thereafter, um, if the first medication has been, ta been taken for more than six weeks, which, inc uh, which tends to increase the risk of withdrawal in this case, so you want to move more slowly, you can also, uh, you can also taper the, the first medication uh, down to, to, um, to the point where the patient is on nothing and then switch to another. Um, you want to do this uh, after a washout period, if the patient is switching from an MAOI to an SSRI or an SSRI to an MAOI because of the high risk of serotonin syndrome with the use of both medications at the same time. You can also do a cross taper uh, where there's no break in treatment. You're really tapering one down at the same time as you're going up on the second med. Um, this tends to lower the risk of experiencing withdrawal, but of course, uh, it increases the risk of drug interactions and serotonin syndrome. Um, so these are the different options available to you, and you can use switchrx.com um, to, uh, to make your lives easier. And this is an example of uh, an algorithm that was recommended by switchrx.com when switching the patient from citalopram to sertraline. So week one, you're starting at 40 milligrams, uh, the dose that the patient is on right now on, on citalopram, and you're starting the lowest dose of sertraline, 25 milligrams. Week two, you're going down by about... Um, percentage by 10 milligrams, um, while you're also increasing the dose of the sertraline to the lowest therapeutic dose. Um, and then you're lowering down the citalopram, you're upping the sertraline. And, and this is just an example of how this tool can be used to help your patients. Um, and to recommend also uh, regimens or titration schedules for uh, physicians, especially family doctors, which tend to have a question about how to go down one med and go up another. Now let's move on to another class of medications, tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, pharmacogenetic studies on tricyclic antidepressants tend to be limited to the pharmacokinetics, so the influence of CYP2D6 and CYP2C19 on response. So we don't have as much pharmacodynamic genetic information. Uh, a lot of the side effects on tricyclic antidepressants tend to be dose-related, such as QTE prolongation, orthostatic hypotension, um, anticholinergic side effects. Uh, as well as cardiotoxicity. So because tricyclic antidepressants tend to be cardiotoxic in overdose, they are avoided uh, in suicidal patients and in hospital, they never start patients on tricyclic antidepressants for that reason. So just be careful with this class of medications in patients who have a history of suicidal ideation. You wanna reserve the use of tricyclic antidepressants for young patients 
those who specifically have neuropathic pain, those at low risk of anxiety, uh, because patients that have the COMT AA variant that tend to have higher dopamine and norepinephrine levels at baseline uh, tend to be at higher risk of anxiety when you're introducing a medication such as a tricyclic antidepressant that has activity on the neuroadrenergic pathway in the brain. Also, ideally, you want to start these medications in patients that do not have a prior cardiac history due to the cardiac risks. And these medications are reserved for use in treatment-resistant ADHD or depression because they tend to be more risky from a side effect standpoint. You can consider uh, Tianiptine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant that's not currently available in Canada. It has been manufactured in France, but it can be accessed through Health Canada Special Access Program, which requires an application from a physician stating the evidence for efficacy, the evidence for safety, um, as well as the reason why this patient needs it. Usually it's, it would be a treatment resistant case that has severe symptoms. Uh, this medication is indicated in patients with depression, anxiety, ADHD, irritable bowel syndrome and asthma, believe it or not, because it tends to lower uh, the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, as well as the shortness of breath that's common with asthma. So if, if your patient has these comorbidities, this is a potential option. The really interesting thing about the mechanism of action of this drug is it's a partial, partial um, agonist at the mu opioid receptor, and it's also a glutamate receptor antagonist, which inhibits the pathological stress-induced changes that can occur in the amygdala and hypothalamus uh, in relation to stress. So if you have a patient who is treatment resistant to you to genes which indicate problems in the HPA, HPA access, um, this is a potential option. And I'm going to discuss these uh, resistant patients in a moment. The really interesting thing about this, this medication, Tianiptine, is that it has a lower risk of sedative, cardiovascular, and anticholinergic side effects. In fact, some studies indicate that it has a nil effect uh, or a nil side effect risk. Um, in terms of uh, cardiovascular and anticholinergic risk. Uh, so this is a potential option for your patient. Now let's move on to MAOIs. Again, pharmacogenetic studies are limited. However, be careful with your comp to AA patients due to increased risk of anxiety. These medications do act on dopamine and norepinephrine. The risk of anxiety tends to be highest with the irreversible MAOIs, which are the older ones that require dietary restrictions. Now, MAOIs work by inhibiting monoamine oxidase, the mitochondrial enzyme that's responsible for the metabolism of monoamines, which are uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. MAOA B uh, is, is selective for dopamine metabolism versus MAOA A, which is selective mostly for serotonin, norepinephrine, and tyramine metabolism, a little bit of dopamine, but mostly serotonin and norepinephrine. The older irreversible non-selective MAOIs have a higher risk of hypertensive crisis with the in ingestion of the tyramine-rich foods, mainly because MA uh, the older MAOIs prevent the metabolism of tyramine. And so if you also ingest foods that are high in tyramine, the risk of a hypertensive crisis is much greater. Uh, the main MAOIs that we're talking about here, the older ones are phenylzine, tranylcypramine, and isocarboxazid. And with, with these medications, you don't want to uh, ingest foods high in tyramine, such as aged, uh, aged foods or foods that are not fresh. So really, you should be telling patients to eat fresh foods and not to eat foods that have been sitting around for hours. Um, you want to avoid aged fruits, uh, for example, such as figs. You also want to avoid other foods high in tyramine, such as fava beans, uh, also aged cheeses, aged wines, etc. There's a whole list of foods that these patients have to be careful uh, in terms of ingestion. And that's the reason why these irreversible MAOIs don't tend to be used often by psychiatrists due to the liability issues associated with them and the close patient monitoring required. Uh, the newer MAOIs have a much lower risk of hypertensive crisis, and there's no need for dietary restriction given certain um, certain things are taken into consideration. For example, with selegiline, it only acts as a selective inhibitor of MAOB and doesn't inhibit MAOA at all at low doses, and that's why it doesn't have that tyramine risk. This medication tends to be used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, and it's only available as a, in the short-acting form. 
in Canada. Uh, the long acting uh, extended release form is available as a patch in the States. And so if you want the patient to use selegiline for the purposes of depression, you don't want to use the short acting form. You really have to uh, have the physician ap apply through the special access program to gain access to the selegiline patch. Uh, this is a useful medication uh, for patients who have been treatment resistant and who don't respond to anything else that's available uh, on the market, including the tricyclics and the SSRIs and the SNRIs. Um, so if you have a comped GG patient, this is a potential option. Uh, for meclobamide, it is a reversible and selective inhibitor of MAOA. Um, because it acts on MAOA mostly, it's more serotonergic than selegiline. And so it's also a potential option for comped AA patients as well. Uh, with this medication, uh, it, it it acts on serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine uh, because it's still an MAOI. Uh, it increases levels of all these three neurotransmitters, and so it is uh, an option for your treatment-resistant patients. The use of MAOIs with SSRIs, SNRIs, opioids, dextromethorphan, St. John's word, et cetera, is contraindicated, as we've mentioned before, due to the risk of serotonin syndrome. However, um, it's also important to note that Stimulants and bupropion can also increase levels of uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, which MAOIs do as well. Um, that can resort in an excess of neurotransmitters, and the use of these medications with MAOIs is contraindicated, contraindicated as well. Now let's move on to general response to antidepressants. Though there are genes that denote specific response to certain SSRIs, there are also genes that denote general response uh, to to most antidepressants. Uh, and these ones are the HPA access stress response genes or the genes involved in neurogenesis, which include FKBP5, GRIC4, and BDNF. I'm going to go over them in a minute. There are also serotonin pathway genes, such as HTR2A, which encodes the serotonin 2A receptor, and GNB3, which is a downstream uh, effector of serotonin response pathways. You also have genes that denote resistance in, uh, nor for noradrenergic, uh, and dopaminergic uh, medications, um, as well as um, it, it involves uh, really do uh, the ADRA2A uh, or the adrenergic 2A receptor is mainly involved in the noradrenergic pathway, which is involved in stress. Um, so it's really an HPA axis pathway. We also see the COMP gene here, which is not a surprise because we knew that COMP GG patients also tend to be generally resistant um, to a lot of the SSRIs and the SMRIs. So the algorithm for general response to antidepressants allows us to flag patients who are more likely to be drug resistant uh, and who may benefit from alternative therapies. Um, generally, these patients with these patients, you can try a lot of the, um, the, for example, meclobamide, selegiline, um, tianiptine, things that may require special access program uh, application. Uh, meclobamide likely doesn't require special access application, so it's a potential option for your patient that is available in Canada. Um, other alternative therapies that these patients may benefit from include uh, the newly prescribed nasal ketamine, uh, which acts mainly on the HPA access pathway, as well as other uh, physical treatments such as repetitive transmagnetic cranial stimulation, etc. These patients may still experience problems with their medications, even if the specific genes involved in response to a particular antidepressant are functioning well. Um, so there is, uh, for example, in the list of drugs, we do have a general um, antidepressant response uh, section that tells you the patient's general response in addition to uh, the, the response that you can see for the individual drugs. So um, the reason why we want to look at general response uh, is because the stress pathway or the HPA axis uh, is highly involved in depression. So whenever a patient is exposed to stress, for example, issues relation, uh, related to relationships such as divorce, finances, school, um, other stressors include substance abuse, job loss, etc. All these can cause overactivation of the stress response pathway or the HPA axis and higher levels of cortisol as we can see in panel A. In panel B, we can see the high levels of cortisol can inhibit uh, the transcription of the BDNF gene, uh, which results in lower levels of BDNF uh, through the glutocorticoid receptors here highlighted in red, as well lower levels of norepinephrine, or epinephrine and lower levels of serotonin and other neurotransmitters can also 
lead to a reduced transcription of BDNF as well. Um, and when you have, as you can see in panel C, when you have lower levels of BDNF, which is a neurotrophic factor, you have a lower production of neurons and a lower amount of dendritic sprouts, which are needed for communication uh, between different neurons. And this is ultimately what happens in the depressed state. And whenever you treat depression, obviously you increase the levels of the neurotransmitters through the use of medications such as SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, MAOIs, which within a couple of hours, uh, what happens is you're raising neurotransmitter levels, you're increasing signal and cascades. However, it takes about three to eight weeks to actually increase the, ex the expression of certain genes such as BDNF and have that those neuron neuronal changes and increase in dendritic sprouts, which ultimately would treat your depression. So this is just to go to show why BDNF is so important uh, in general response to antidepressants and why the BDNF gene is part of our general response pathway. It's also important to note here that FKBP5 is the, the gene that I mentioned before. FKBP5 is important because when it attaches to the glutocorticoid receptors, it prevents the, the changes uh, that happen during the stress response, which require uh, the glutocorticoid receptor to be available to either shut down certain genes or increase their transcription um, in the stress state. So that is why the FKBP5 gene is part of our uh, general response pathway, because it's a negative regulator of the HPA axis. Here, uh, I've denoted an example from a study called polymorphisms in GRIC4, HTR2A, and FKPP5 show interactive effects in predicting remission to antidepressant treatment. In this article, the researchers looked at different genetic variations in the GRIC4 glutamatergic gene, FKBP5, which I mentioned was the negative regulator of the stress response, as well as the HTR2A, which is a serotonin 2A receptor. And researchers showed that patients with the positive variants in both GRIC4 and FKBB5 tend to show a higher rate of remission uh, versus the ones that only had uh, one, one of the positive variants in one of the genes or, none of, or, or the ones that didn't have any of the positive variants in, in either gene. So um, same thing here that we see with the, with the 2A gene and the GRIC4, that if you had the positive variants, you're more likely to respond than if you only had one of the genes uh, having the positive variant. Uh, or if you had none of the genes at all, then you're, uh, you, your percentage remission after five weeks is very, very low. So there's definitely an interaction going on between the glut glutamatergic um, as well as the, the serotonergic and the, the stress response HPA axis genes. I also wanted to talk about here um, how uh, there are other studies um, such as the one shown here, which looked at how social isolation stress um, can cause changes in the brain. And here we can see that whenever someone has been uh, experienced a social isolation as a chronic stressor, there can be activation of the HPA access, decreased BDNF, serotonin 2A receptors, as well as an increase in the adrenergic receptors. And you also see an increase in, in, in the glut glutamatergic pathways, which ultimately lead to anxiety and depression. Now, this is based on animal studies. However, uh, this is a good explanation for why uh, we see these HPA access genes involved in general response. Now, what do we do for treatment-resistant patients, the patients that have HPA access issues genetically or COMP-GG patients? Now, for those patients, you, you want to look at triple neurotransmitter inhibitors. So these are medications that act on all three neurotransmitter pathway, pathways. I've included some of the drugs here that we've spoken about before, meclomavide, available in Canada, so allegedly and available through special access program. You also have your dopamine reuptake inhibitors for your COMP-GG patients that have uh, that are predisposed to lower levels of dopamine and norepinephrine at baseline. You want to try bupropion or a stimulant, especially if the patient also has ADHD. You can use dual reuptake inhibitors, such as low-dose tricyclic antidepressants, uh, disipramine, nortriptyline, or tianiptine, uh, because these are the ones that tend to have lower side effects and other medications of the same class. You can try SNRIs, um, which act on serotonin and norepinephrine pathways, such as levomilnociprine, desvenlafaxine, etc. If the SSRI is needed for comorbid anxiety or OCD, uh, and you have no other option but to use an SSRI, you want to consider one with a low risk of cognitive side effects, such as sertraline, which has some dopaminergic activity, as well as uh, as well as medications that have weak norepinephrine reuptake activity, such as vilazidone or vortioxetine, that tend to be also um, more easily tolerated from a side effect standpoint. 
for your CompGG patients um, that have lower levels of dopamine and norepinephrine and may be more sensitive to concentration related issues. Um, other options, which I'm going to discuss, include intranasal ketamine, which is very newly available in the market in Canada, um, as well as other physical therapies such as transmagnetic stimulation or electroconvulsive therapy. You don't want to go ever to electro electroconvulsive therapy right away. Um, unfortunately, guidelines state that if your patient has tried multiple antidepressants and have failed them, this is really your next go-to. Um, however, for us with pharmacogenetics, we have more information to be able to recommend alternatives for patients before going to this um, last line option mainly because electroconvulsive therapy can cause long-term memory problems for the patient that are irreversible. Um, so we, it's safer to use a medication and try a medication treatment before deciding to go that route. Also, there are safer physical therapies such as transmagnetic stimulation, which don't have these irreversible side effects that you can consider for your patient. Uh, I wanted to highlight meclobamide here uh, because it's a very important patient, uh, sorry, it's a very important treatment for your patient that is available in Canada. As I mentioned before, it's a reversible inhibitor of the MAOA enzyme involved in mostly serotonin and norepinephrine uh, metabolism, but also some dopamine metabolism as well. You want to consider it for patients that are highly resistant to SSRIs and SNRIs, your CompGG patients. Its place in therapy, according to Canadian CANMAT guidelines, is that it's a second line option. Uh, and really, it's indicated for anxiety, depression, ADHD. Believe it or not, it's a first line antidepressant for dementia patients, for your elderly patients, uh, because it tends to be very, very safe and tends to have lower cognitive risk than, than other antidepressants in the market. It can be used for smoking cessation and it can be used for fibromyalgia. Um, so it's a very important tr uh, treatment option for your patients with comorbidities. It's superior to tricyclics and, anti and irreversible MAOIs in terms of side effects. It lacks sedative, cardiovascular and anticholinergic side effects. Um, so there you go. If your patient is having problems with concentration, um, this is a potential option for them. It has a very low risk of sexual dysfunction. As a, a, as I mentioned, it's very safe for use in the elderly. It can improve cognition. It's not part of generally uh, part of the, the guidelines for the elderly. As I mentioned before, your, your options, your safest options in the elderly are sertraline, citalopram, and e-citalopram. However, um, in addition to these guidelines, later studies did show uh, it is a potential first line option if your patient does have dementia and cognitive issues. Um, some of the side effects, um, they're, they're really, um, side effects are usually very tolerable and they're very rare. These side effects include excitation, irritability, and mania. I also wanted to talk about intranasal, a new intranasal ketamine spray that's available in Canada called Spravato, uh, or uh, it's, it's a ketamine deriv derivative called S-ketamine. Really, the way that it works is mostly in the glutamatergic pathways in the HPA axis, which is why this is a potential option for treatment-resistant depression and for patients who have poor general response to antidepressants as per the personalized prescribing algorithms. Uh, so for these patients, you want to use esketamine because it inhibits the M NMDA receptor and results in normalization of stress-induced HPA axis changes. It's last line for treatment-resistant patients. Um, as I mentioned, you want to consider it for patients that have GRIC4, BDNF, or FKBP5 issues. Um, the way that it's used is it's, it tends to be administered regularly, which is why it's not practical for most patients as a first go-to option. It's administered, it has to be administered in a physician's office uh, with, mon with monitoring. It's used twice weekly for the first month followed by once weekly thereafter. Um, and it has to be used as adjunctive therapy with an SSRI or an SNRI. Um, and the patient needs to be observed in the office two hours after they get that spray. Um, and they may not drive until the next day because of it can cause problems with, such as dizziness, problems with motor coordination. Um, and as I mentioned before, it must be administered in the presence of a healthcare professional in the physician's office. And that's mainly due to the risk of increased blood pressure that can lead to hypertensive crisis. Uh, as I mentioned before, the EDRs include dizziness, sedation, cognitive impairment, increase in blood pressure. It's contraindicated in patients with unstable cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, or respiratory conditions, uh, as well as in patients whom increase in blood pressure uh, or increase in, in intracranial uh, pressure can pose serious risk. So your patients will have a history of stroke, uh, especially if um, it's, it's not well managed 
esketamine is not a good option for them. It's very expensive. It's not currently covered by ODB. It may be covered by private plans soon. Um, it is a potential option for your treatment resistant patients that are able to afford it. Next, I want to talk about antidepressant tachyphylaxis. It's not commonly a topic that is discussed, but it's something that we do see with our patients. And this occurs in patients who are responding well to a medication and who are good response responders according to our pharmacodynamic algorithms. However, they can still experience a recurrent episode months later, usually within a year. Especially if the patient, there are changes in the patient's psychosocial environment. So, for example, um, the, the patient could be doing okay on a medication. The pharmacodynamic algorithms indicate that the medication is effective for the patient, but all of a sudden, there's a new stressor, the, either a divorce or new job stressors, uh, which which necessitate increasing the dose, uh, or as we will be discussing, um, a switch in the medication. So, really, eighty depressant tachyphylaxis is defined as a condition of losing a previously effective response while, st while still on adequate treatment. Um, it's also known as uh, tolerance or antidepressant poop out. Um, the incident at which it occurs, according to the National Institute of Mental Health Collaborative Depres Depressive Study, is about 25%. Um, the, this study showed that it can occur from three to 12 months. In our clinical experience, we see it when patients are on medications for a year or more. Um, it can be objectively measured by what's called the Rothschild Scale for Antidepressant Tachyphylaxis. This scale includes six self-report items, which really look at um, symptoms of depression that can come back, such as symptoms of apathy or decreased motivation and fatigue, dullness and cognitive function, sleep disturbance, weight gain, and sexual dysfunction, uh, which are signs that depression is not well controlled or the medication is not effective anymore. When you're assessing for antidepressant tachyphylaxis, you want to make you want to assess the patient's uh, adherence to the medication, that they're taking the medication regularly as prescribed. Um, you want to also assess the dose, whether you can increase the dose, um, and how long the patient has been on this medication for. Uh, obviously, if the patient has been on this medication for, for less than two weeks, then they haven't really gotten to that therapeutic uh, effect. And if the dose is not therapeutic for the patient, um, again, that's not a sign of antidepressant depressant tachyphylaxis, so it's just a sign of inadequate therapy. You also want to assess substance abuse. That's a, that's a potential confounder. And you want to also um, discuss with a physician uh, whether or not there's a bipolar cyclic disorder going on if you suspect that the patient um, did have uh, signs of mania. Again, this mechanism only occurs with chronic exposure to a medication. Um, ways that anti Antidepressant tachyphylaxis can occur can be due to pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic tolerance. With pharmacokinetics, there's changes in drug concentration at the target site of action due to either absorption, uh, distribution, metabolism, or excretion, and uh, pharma uh, pharmacokinetic changes there. Um, one of the ways to deal with pharmacokinetic tolerance is to increase the dose. That's the first step. It's not necessarily always um, an effective uh, an effective management strategy. Um, so sometimes you do need to switch the patient to another medication that our algorithms indicate that can be appropriate for them also from an efficacy standpoint. Um, there can be pharmacodynamic tolerance, for example, a down regulation of the serotonin 1A receptor, opposing biological processes also that increase vulnerability to relapse. Uh, so the body likes to establish homeostasis and is going to oppose the influence of the medication. Uh, so one of the ways to manage pharmacodynamic tolerance is to try drug holidays or temporary dose reduction for three to four weeks. You can change to a different drug, ideally one with a different mechanism of action due to the pharmacodynamic that, that won't be as susceptible to the, to the same level of tolerance. Um, you want you want to also monitor for discontinuation side effects if you are um, changing if you are changing to a different drug. You can also augment the SSRI with uh, something with a, diff with a drug with a different mechanism of action, such as bupropion, buspirone. You can try adding on leucovorin or SAMI. I also wanted to take some time to mention the fact that having a patient's pharmacogenetic information presents a great opportunity for us to de-prescribe de potentially harmful medications that can have many side effects and instead find a medication that's actually likely to be effective with the least risk of side effects. So as you know, guidelines usually recommend that in treatment resistant patients, we can use antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, or adjunctive therapy with amphetamines. 
However, uh, there are some patients who have been prescribed an antipsychotic after failing only two SSRIs or SNRIs in the real world. And it is possible that the physician just did not have access to the pharmacogenomic information to prescribe an alternative SSRI or SNRI that is likely to be effective for the patient. And so it's important to note also that most patients experience limited benefit and many side effects on antipsychotics. So it's really preferable to use an alternative. We would only use an antipsychotic or mood stabilizer if the patient has suspected bipolar or schizophrenia, or really if the pharmacogenomic test shows that there isn't an alternative safer medication. Otherwise, you would want to use an SSRI, an SNRI, a reversible or selective MAOI, or adjunctive therapy with ketamine, or even physical therapies, such as, for example, transmagnetic stimulation. This would be preferable to using a drug long term, which can cause potentially harmful side effects for the patient. So having pharmacogenetic information is a great opportunity for deprescribing. It is ultimately preferable that your patient is only using one or two medications to treat their anxiety or depression, and you want to limit polypharmacy and use the lowest effective dose to treat the symptoms. Sometimes if you're on the right drug, but the dose that you're taking is too high, then you're actually having an opposing effect. Too much serotonin and too much norepinephrine or dopamine can cause harmful effects and can make depression worse. So you want to really get that sweet spot for your patient. If you are deprescribing medications such as antipsychotics or amphetamines, you want to provide evidence to the physician for the reason of discontinuing the medication, either pharmacogenetic information to justify it, or you want to use the patient's clinical history of side effects. For example, on amphetamines, patients may experience tolerance to the mood lifting effects. They may also experience a midday or end of day stimulant crash where they, where they have rebound depression and symptoms such as fatigue, low mood, or poor concentration. On antipsychotics, your patient may experience sedation that can interfere with the ability to function at school or at work. They can experience anticholinergic side effects such as memory and concentration problems. They can have symptoms of mood disorders that can be irreversible, and the D2 receptor antagonist properties of antipsychotics may negatively affect motivation and reward, blunt emotional affect, and cause fatigue and worsening in mood in most patients. Patients who try to discontinue these medications can experience anxiety, panic, mood lability, so crying midday, and these these discontinuation side effects usually occur two to three weeks after discontinuing an antipsychotic or a prescription amphetamine. So to help your patients get through these discontinuation side effects, you want to recommend that the physician considers the use of a benzodiazepine or trazodone at bedtime for insomnia for that short period of time just until the patient gets through the withdrawal uh, side effects. And so that your patient can then use a medication that's likely to be effective with the least risk of side effects for more of long-term treatment of their anxiety and depression. And ultimately, you have to tell the patient to be patient to get through these discontinuation side effects to finally get the benefit of being able to function better at school and at work.